Let's go to 89, Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 119 and verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances. For all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for... With them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou hast, or th thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words to my, unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it, and I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Except I beseech thee the freewill offerings of my mouth. O Lord, teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. Just a sample there. I really want to focus in. First of all, you see that, that, that the delight of the psalm writer here, as he's just pouring out his heart, always focusing every verse here on the statutes of God. Here, here in the heart of the Bible is the heart of the Bible, a man's love for the word and how his word changes and helps him. He says, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. He's always, he's always just just turning back to the Bible as his sole authority, guide, helper, caregiver. It says down in verse 104, it says, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. If you know the truth, then error and falsehood is going to be abhorrent unto you. You're going to hate it because, because the truth is so so much richer, so much stronger, so much more, more kind to people. It's just, it's just fullness of God here is what we have in these words. I'm preaching today about false accusations. False accusations. <clears throat> Many of us have been on the receiving end of false accusations. People, people slander us. People defame our character. People try to, try to use their words and their, their bent um, interpretation of a scenario to, to hurt and to harm us. Yet through thy precepts, we, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. We ought, we ought to hate false ways, false accusations, errors made especially directed at the people of God, even sometimes ourselves. If you could, you could go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And I know you were here last week. Listen to the preaching. Matthew chapter 24. If you were to look in verse 7. Matthew 24 and verse 7. We'll see a little snippet of the end times. And it says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then, verse 9, shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, 
and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The Bible talks about, at this time, love waning and waxing cold. There, there's no love one for another. People don't care one for another. And we've seen that a little bit now, even where we stand. That everyone is full of self, selfishness, self-righteousness. I need to get my own. I need to, I need to find my own path. I need to make my own way, right? Don't, don't look out for who you're stepping on. The Bible says because the iniquity is abounding and growing more and more, that's, that's the cause of love waxing cold. The, the commands at this time are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, mind, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. And, and as the iniquity abounds, you've got to think there's more hatred towards, towards God and there's more hatred towards your fellow man. Loving your neighbor is, is a long, long since past and forgotten thing at this time. And so here, though, one of the common things and the common occurrences is that men are delivering other men to be afflicted. Men are delivering other men to be killed. Hated of all nations is what the believers will be for the name of the Father's sake. For my name's sake, for his reputation's sake, for who he is as a God's sake. We should be hated of all nations. And this in verse 11, false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And that is a common occurrence in the last days. The greatest of false prophets we'll ever see will point to the beast empowered by Satan and, and course many to follow after him. And so false prophets, statements are being made and honestly that's that's the only way that a verse 9 could really occur being delivered to be afflicted being delivered to be and killed and it's it's because of the offense of people in their sins and in their iniquities and in their in their their false ways that they just spew it out about others in order to get themselves clear and clean they're, they're trying to they're trying to get rid of a plague at this time and the plague is bible believing christians False prophets shall arise, and this is a mark of the last days. And as false prophets arise, so will just average Joe false teacher, false, false preacher, false speaker. False accusations shall arise. And this was seen in Christ's life. Go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. In verse 57, Matthew 26, in verse 57. It says, and they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Now you see that the ones that are judging you would think that they'd be seeking after true witnesses. But no, they sought after specifically false witness. It was, it was a coveted item. We hate as Christians every false way. And yet, here are these, these wicked chief priests and elders of the Jewish council are seeking after false witnesses. They love them. They want more of them. Verse 60 says, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet... Found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ. The Son of God. So we see the cowardice of the false witnesses. Many arise, many arose and, and came to this, but it says that they they were able to find none. The, the chief priests and the elders were able to find none that would actually proclaim their false witness. They've been whispering in the background. They had been they've been telling others of their tales about all of the horrific things that Jesus had done. And yet when the time came to put their money where their mouth was, they found none that would stand up and, and condemn Jesus. 
At last two came and they finally said that this, is, this man said he will destroy this temple and in three days would rebuild it. But that was simply preaching that Jesus did to everybody. Everybody would have heard that preaching. And it was spiritually minded where he was simply proclaiming that if you destroy me, as you're about to do, in three days I will rise from the dead. And you'll be worse off for it. False witnesses rose up against Christ after they were being coveted and desired and, and brought in to do so. But if you notice, the accusation that was made wasn't the one even that condemned him. You'll notice that it was his own words that came after in verse 64. Jesus saith unto him, mind you, he was adjured here by the living God to answer whether or not he was the Christ. Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. It wasn't even the accusation of the accusers that brought him to the point where he was condemned. It was his own words, the words of his mouth. And that just shows that false accusers, their end is an obvious, their, their means and the things that they do aren't often what leads somebody to the end. It's when they're brought before a council that already has a preconceived notion that the, that the judgment falls, and it falls in the order that they intended to begin with. They never had to speak any error that stuck. They just needed to raise enough questions about the man that they were accusing. And this is what false accusations do. They, they, they compile and they steamroll and they get bigger. They get more exaggerated until eventually all of these accusations seem to be pressed up against the person that is innocent. And yet many see it as if he was guilty. Because of, that's, the, that's the harm that false accusations can do. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad is what he's charging here. If you go back to verse 10, it said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. We're to rejoice in this, okay? When false accusations come against us as believers, it's hard, but we need to rejoice in this. This means that we're standing in good standing in the same footsteps that Jesus did. As false accusers came to him and began to spit their lies and to tell their untruths and in cowardice whisper behind the scenes in order to sway the multitude's opinion of the man. False accusations are commonplace for Christians. Look, Jesus just started preaching to the multitudes up in the mountain, his Sermon in the Mountain. One of the first topics he gets to is that when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. When you're reviled and people are saying all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, you're blessed. Rejoice in this. Be exceeding glad. There is a great reward in heaven awaiting for you for the false accusation that you just took upon you. When people speak falsely against us, rejoice and be exceeding glad is what Jesus commands and exhorts us to do. Go back to Matthew chapter 26. We'll notice as Jesus begins teaching about the last days, as I already mentioned, that false witness is going to be prevalent. It's going to be commonplace in the last days. There's going to be a whole world of people that are deceived by a false prophet pointing people to the Antichrist to worship him, to bow down to him, to take a mark in their right hand or in their forehead in order that they would be yoked up permanently with him. And the false witness is going to do a great work because many are going to follow his pernicious ways and follow that path. Now, how as Christians, knowing that this is on our doorstep, knowing that more and more we're going to receive false witness against us, knowing that more and more the world is going to lie about us and say they caught you doing this and caught you doing that, and, and we saw him, and, 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 and this is what we saw, and we guarantee it, and witnesses are going to rise and lie about us. What is Christian responsibility to do in these scenarios? How do we react? 
Well, the first thing you'll see is Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. It says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We need to watch and pray. As, as these scenarios come into our lives where people start lying about us and, and start saying all manner of evil against us falsely for our Lord's sake, we need to be watching and praying in advance of these things as they come. That you enter not into temptation. What can be more tempting or, or, or more of a trial than when somebody is, is just blatantly lying about your character, blatantly lying about your person, about your, your family even, just, just constantly throwing in, in, in the teeth of others, whispering around about you um, as if you had done some wickedness that you had never done, as if you had some character flaw that you clearly don't have. There's, there's a temptation there, and that's highlighted where it says the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The temptation is that we would get in the flesh and react in the flesh, attack back, fight back, talk back, try to defend ourselves. The first state, the first point that I want to highlight is that we need to be watching and in prayer for these things to come, because these things will come more and more. If God highlighted it as a last day's um, item that you would see men rising up against men, men lying about one another, deception and being deceived, being a highlight of the last days thing, and we're in the last days, I believe, then you need to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, that you're prepared for these things. Prepare by praying before these things ever happen. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 63 says the next statement that I think we need to do when false accusations come our way. Matthew 26, verse 63. What about this? But Jesus held his peace. Now, when people are falsely accusing us and people are, are, are telling lies about us, it's easy for us to start running our mouths back, maybe defending ourselves, maybe, maybe starting to tell stories about them. Maybe, maybe, maybe we're, just, we're just always trying to explain our way out of a scenario. But here Jesus very clearly just holds his peace as the false witnesses come to him. I think he counted that truth will always prevail in these scenarios. And while, while men will lie, God is ultimately the way, the truth, and the life, and he will bring these things to pass. Also, remember that as people lie to you, why are you, you going to talk back to try to stop it? You're, just, you're getting more blessings. And if you try to stop it and defend yourself, well, then you're just kind of cutting yourself off and of receiving the ultimate gift that God had planned for you. So hold your peace. When Christians are falsely accused against, watch and pray. Hold your peace. The truth always comes to light. The plan is to condemn you if that is the plan, if that is the goal in a false, uh, a false prophet scenario. If, if, if there's a bunch of false prophets that arise against you and they have any authority over you, if the plan is to condemn and to destroy you, whether or not you defend yourself, you'll be condemned and destroyed anyways. Right? You're not going to get out of the scenario of what men have for you. And that's what played out with Jesus here. He didn't answer the witnesses, and yet he still ended up going to the cross, didn't he? He didn't talk back to the witnesses. He held his peace, and he went to the cross anyways. So the best thing we can do then is to just watch, pray, hold your peace when the false accusations fly. Go to Matthew chapter 10. See the next one? Matthew chapter 10. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10. And in verse 16, the Bible says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So that's the reality of every Christian walk. We are sheep, we are following our shepherd, and we're amongst ravening wolves who just want to destroy us. They're constantly looking for an in, an advantage over us. Behold, I send you forth as that. God intended this to be so. It's not a surprise to God when we are constantly under the attack and under the threat and under the danger of wolves taking control over us or attacking us or destroying us. Verse 17, I think, parallels the wolves to this. It says, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. So here he says, men are going to do these things to you. You will be delivered up. You will be brought before counsel. You will be lied about. You, you will be attacked in those times. 
And when it happens, take no thought of how or what you should speak. How often is there, a, is there an opportunity that comes up where someone has lied about you or you think somebody's lied about you and you're about to be brought before a council? Maybe somebody lied about me at work and I'm about to be brought before the HR department and, and my managers and plant operations or something like that. I'm about to be brought before the council and I'll sit there at my desk maybe knowing it's happening 10, 20 minutes from now, just stewing about what I'm going to say. How am I going to defend myself? When the reality is, is I'm just, I'm just making presumptions about what was said and having an, an assumed response. I don't even know what was said. Maybe I'm getting invited in for a promotion and I've worried about nothing, right? Somebody said something good about me. So God requires and, and expects that we would, we would take no thought for these things. Why? Because if we're spirit-led believers, and the Bible promises that he shall speak for you. It shall be given you in that same hour what he shall speak. So take no thought before, but at that moment, at that hour, at that opportune time, it says in verse 20, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. This is another way that he's just teaching what we saw in Matthew chapter 24. He's saying that the time is going to come when you will be delivered by a brother. And who knows more about you than a brother that could, that could spin your story and lie about you? How about a child to the fa of the father? How about, how about parents of the children and the children of the parents? Deception from within, lies within, that they could deliver the Christian. You shall be hated of all men for Christ's name's sake, for the Christian name, for the banner that you wave as a Bible-believing Christian. You shall be hated. And yet, at this time, God adjures you, don't think before what you shall do. When you're delivered unto the council, when you're brought before kings, when you're brought before um, great spiritual leaders and they want a testimony from you, the Spirit speaks. And you gave a testimony like that uh, earlier, that... that I read, where, where it just seemed like it was a spirit-led day when you were brought before a council to explain yourself, to explain your position. God has this way of taking an unprepared heart and mind and just molding it to his own. That's why we need to walk by faith. Let God do the speaking for us. So watch and pray. Hold your peace. Let the spirit speak. Fourth point, Matthew chapter 10 and 23, right there. And when they persecute you in this city... Flee ye into another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? What are they saying here? They called your Lord the devil. They called your Lord all types of names. <clears throat> You should expect to receive the same. It is enough for you to be as your Lord. And that's the fourth point, is that you need to remember that you're following in Jesus' steps when you are being falsely accused. When you have false accusations flying your way, when people are lying about you. It is enough for you to be as your master, as a disciple. It is enough for you to be as your Lord. You're not above him. You're not better than to have accusations fly about you. Oh, how could they say something like this about me? Well, that's fit. That's, that's needful. That, that's exactly where you ought to be. Just as your Lord was receiving false accusations coming your way, if they even called him the devil, how much more could they call you? And you could receive it without thinking that it's beneath you. Remember, you're following in Jesus' steps. Look at verse 26. It says, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. For ye not therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Fear them not, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. There is nothing hid that shall not be made known. What is he saying? Don't be afraid. 
And that's another point that's highlighting the fact that the truth will always come out. When you're being lied about, don't fret. Don't fear. They can't hurt you. Don't fear men that the worst that they could do is condemn you and lie about you and you lose your job. The worst they could do is condemn you and lie about you. And the, the ultimate is that they just take your life away. Don't fear them. Fear God that's able to destroy both your life and soul in hell. Fear God first and foremost and you'll fear nothing else. Fear him and let your conscience be clean before him and let him talk. Let him run their mouths. Don't be afraid of these false accusations as they fly. Don't be afraid of the men that let them fly and come at you. You need to watch and pray. These things are coming to pass. You need to hold your peace when people are lying about you. When it comes time to speak, let the Spirit speak through you. Don't meditate about how you ought to answer these accusations. Remember you're following in Jesus' step, and don't be afraid. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. You're already there. I can just read it for you. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. It was highlighted in Philippians chapter 4. You can go there. Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. Philippians chapter 4. It's kind of a conclusion of this whole matter. Talking about the Christian life and the walk that we have, even when things are tough. So, when you know that you're following the same steps of Jesus... Shouldn't that bring joy to your heart? Shouldn't that make you happy to know that you're as your master, you're as your Lord, you're following along with him? That's the Bible commands that somebody that's being lied about would do. Rejoice and be exceeding glad when they're lying about you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad when they're saying things about you falsely for his name's sake. Just because you're trying to be a believer, you're trying to follow Christ, and suddenly everyone is lying about you and slandering your character and saying all manner of evil against you falsely. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And that's the main reason why you can rejoice is the fact that God is at hand. He's coming. He will recompense. He will repay. He will set things right. You don't need to defend yourself. You don't need to explain yourself. God is coming to set all of these things right. God is coming and the truth will come with him. It will be seen very clearly. Be careful for nothing. We're always full of care. That's verse 6. We're always full of caring about these situations. Oh, people are going to perceive me this way. Oh, people have lied about me. My character is being tarnished. Oh, no, what do I do? How do I defend myself? How do I keep my job? How do I keep my livelihood? How do I keep my life? Be careful for nothing. Not full of care. Let it go. But in everything by prayer and supplication, by, by asking God for supply... With thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. Let your request be made known unto God. Just simply ask for things. You don't need to care. You don't need to worry. If you're being brought before a council that you know has just lied about you, just say, Lord, will you take care of this? I'm thankful you're putting me through this. I'm thankful you've counted me worthy to be lied about. I'm thankful that you're storing up treasures in heaven for me because I'm patiently going through this. Lord, I know my conscience is clear. God, just carry me through this. You take care of it. I'm not going to care for these things. I'm not going to be full of care for what's ahead of me. I'm asking you, God, supply my need. And I'm thankful that you're doing this. It's the type of prayer that you can just give to God and just release it. Let it go. Because God's going to make sure that these things are set right. God's going to make sure that they are recompensed for their falsehood. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that's where the biggest problem comes when these situations come up. People start lying about you. People are going to bring you before a judge, before a council, with all of their errors that they have stacked up against you. What you need at that time is peace. You need your mind and heart to be settled. You need to be calm. And the only way that you can be calm is not to fret, to worry, and to plan, and to plot about it. It's to just simply release it. Give it back to God. One of the things you can do is just think about things that are, as the Bible says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. 
good report, not the evil reports and the lies that are coming to you. Think about the good reports. And that's the one way that Christians can encourage other Christians who are being slandered and lied about, is to bring them good report. My wife says that she learned this lesson in part when I was being attacked by, by people in the movement, in this area that we know. People were attacking me and lying about me. She kept bringing unto me based on the advice that she had gotten from a pastor's wife who had gotten it from another pastor's wife as they have all gone through these types of things was to bring to your husband good reports. They're saying about you that you never go soul winning and you don't care about souls. Honey, I remember that one time that you were out there doing this and you were out there last week and you were late for dinner because you went soul winning like last week and all this kind of stuff. They're lying about you. They're wrong. She would bring to me good reports. That way I could meditate on good report, not on all the lies that were stacked up against me in the, uh, the 10,000 list of mm-hmm. things that Brother Josh is doing wrong. <laughs> right? The red flags that came yeah. at me. <laughs> but it helps when we give those things to God. We don't care about them. We don't worry about them. And we start to just let the peace of God rule in our hearts by him keeping us there because we've already prayed, we've already given it to him, leave it there, bring your burden to the Lord and leave it there and suddenly I can move on and think about the things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, with virtue and with praise. I don't have to be bogged down by the lies that are coming in my way. That's how a Christian ought to react. Be content to follow after Jesus in his ways. That's what it says in verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now as the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you also were careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And this is a lesson that, it, well, this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I read the Apostle Paul right. I have learned. <laughs> I have learned this, because this is something that doesn't come naturally to me, to just be content in whatever state I'm in. I generally would like when people just like me. I I get along with people. I don't have people that are hating me. But the time comes when people are hating you and reviling you and cursing you uh, for for the Lord's sake, and suddenly I don't feel so content. The Apostle Paul, he went through it with the worst of them. He had so many people turn their backs, um, lie about him, try to throw him in prison, try to get him killed. And yet he learned something along the way to whatsoever state he is in, therewith be content. We all need to learn that. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed. You see how he's being instructed? He's still learning this. This is something that you grow into. Sometimes when, when you're walking the Christian life, you get born again, you tell some one of your friends about, about Jesus, and suddenly they're slandering you to all your friends. He's this Bible-believing Jesus freak now. You know that his, his, whole, his whole bookshelf now is nothing but Bibles. They're in some kind of cult. They, 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 you know, they, start, they start saying all these things about you. But honestly, in the grand scheme of things, in your baby Christianity, these are very minor things. And you know what they often do? They have a whole bunch of friends that weren't good friends to begin with leave your life. And yet, that can be a a struggle for people. That can be very hard. But you go through that trial, and you learn something through it, and you're a little bit stronger for it. The early Christian life, it feels like it's rocking you, but then when you look back on it now, you're like, man, that friend was a drunk, that friend was this. These were not good people to have in my life. I'm glad that that one friend lied about me, and they all took off. Praise the Lord for that, right? You look back, and you see that you've learned something. But then as you grow in the Christian life, things get a little bit more tough. Suddenly, you know, here's my story. I had, I had, I had the unspoken man coming at me, right? I had the, I had the unspoken um, guy. <laughs> the, the guy, right? Um, Hill McGlever. <laughs> I had him coming at me and, and attacking me. I didn't know him from Adam. I wasn't friends with him before. It just seemed very impersonal and kind of funny to begin with, right? It was hard. It was, it was a little bit of a challenge because I didn't want his lies uh, distributing to other people and then believing it, whatever. I could let go of that. But a little time passed, and it wasn't, it wasn't just friends that I shouldn't 
be associating with anyways that turned their back and left me when they lied about were, lied to about me. It wasn't now just just some random clown that had made me public enemy number one was attacking me. But soon after that, it was people that I had ministered to and ministered with and tried to help and tried to love and tried to support, tried to care for. Now they're turning on me. Now they're lying about me falsely for his name's sake. Now they're saying all manner of evil against me. Now they're falsely accusing me of things that I never did and never came to my heart to do. And suddenly that, that hurts a little bit more. I didn't have a good relationship with those guys. But in that, I learned how to be content whatsoever state I'm in. I was instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me is the bottom line lesson. Now, flash forward a little bit further. There's going to be people that I didn't just know for a few months that had hurt me. But there's going to be people that I've known for years and years and years and worked with that are ultimately going to hurt me. You have to grow through these stages of Christian life. Because where does it get to? Where does the Bible tell us it gets to? Children are, are betraying their parents to the death. Can you imagine your child lying about you falsely and getting you turned over to the authorities so you can go and be beheaded for the name of Christ? What, 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 about, what about fathers to sons? What about... What about Brethren, what about your close brothers and sisters that you know that are betraying you, lying about you, slandering you? That's going to hurt a lot. Spouses, families being ripped apart. Jesus said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. All these things are coming, and it's good for us that we learn, we're instructed, that in the end, no matter if we're riding high in life or riding low, things are easy, things are tough. We're just in love with the walk with Christ and our brothers and sisters around us, or they're all turning on us and lying about us. We need to know and be content with the fact that everything, we can do everything through Christ which strengthens us. And that's where our strength has to come from. Otherwise, we're not going to survive these things. And so when you are lied about, when you are railed upon, when you're falsely accused of things, and, and you never did it, it never came to your heart, have a clean conscience before God and trust Him to carry you through that. Because do you know what He's doing? When He's letting you go in through that fire, He's, he's making you more pure. That's how the, that's how the finer makes, takes a piece of a clump of lead and turns it into gold. He takes it and he brings it to the fire and the impurities fall off. He takes it and brings it to the fire and the impurities fall off. And everything falls away from it as it goes through the fire to the end that it is pure gold. And that's what Jesus wants to do with us. We have impurities. We have dross. We have things in our life that we don't need. And so he puts us to the fire and takes us out. And puts us through the fire and takes us out. Puts us through the fire. Each time dross comes off. Each time impurities come off. Until we're 100% pure in the image of Christ. That's his end goal for each and every one of us. So you got to let him do these things because in the end you'll be better for it. You will learn something from it. You will grow in it. To the end that we're going to be betrayed by our children. We're going to be betrayed by our kin. Those of your own house, the Bible says, will be those that send you to death. Put you to death by turning you over, by lying about you. Yeah, I saw him reading his Bible. Yeah, I saw him praying at a time when it was illegal, right? Yeah, he's got this big book in his house. You know, they're doing that in public schools now. Now, kids, did your parents have one of these big black books in their house? Just let us know about it. They're having kids. They're having. They're having kids take their adult, their parents' firearms, and bring them to the authorities. Kids, do your parents have guns in the house? That's not safe. You should go get them and bring them to the proper authorities and turn them in. Right? <laughs> little, little by little, these things are happening and rolling out in the legislature to where once it's illegal to have this book. Right? They'll say, kids, your parents got one of these big books in their house? Yeah, yeah, they do. And maybe even unwillingly, maybe with no malicious intent, kids are betraying their parents unto the death. That's what the end times entails. That's what's coming. Christians, how do we react? We watch and pray. Be prepared for these things. We hold our peace when the accusations come. Let the Spirit speak when the time comes for the Spirit to speak. Remember that you are now following in the steps of Jesus. Don't be afraid. Rejoice and be exceeding glad in that day, knowing that you're, you're, you're just gaining treasures in heaven because of it. 
Let the peace of God come over you by meditating upon good and right and pure and just and lovely things and just be content in that position to be following the Lord, to have him have his way with you, leading you in this path, because in the end, you'll be better for it. You'll learn something. You'll grow from it. These little baby trials, they, they seem awful when you're in them, right? Those trials just seem like the worst thing in the world. But in hindsight, you'll be like, wow, that wasn't so bad. And so the next trial is not so challenging. It's still hard. You get into it, and you feel like you're being pressed without measure. You're struggling not to get in the flesh. You're struggling to let these things go. You're struggling to let God lead you through this and carry you through this and be content where you're at. And then the other side of it, you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I can see God moving in that scenario. Now, regarding specifically false teachers, and I'll go to that, I, I give you a little bit of, you go to Deuteronomy chapter 19. <clears throat> I think we can take comfort in the fact that God's in control of these things. We know what we have to do. We need to watch, pray, hold our peace, let the Spirit speak. Remember that you're following Jesus' steps. Don't be afraid, rejoice, be exceeding glad at this time, and be content to follow Jesus through it. And also be content that he's got these guys pegged, okay? People that lie, and this is a warning to us because we can get caught in the same sin. People that have false witness against others, you know that's one of the things that God hates? These six things doth mm -hmm. the Lord hate. And one of them is a false witness that speaketh lies. A false witness that speaketh lies. And you know what, Christians? You can be something that God hates. You can do something that God hates if you were a false witness speaking lies. And we, we have tendency to do this all the time, especially in the social media world. We will hear something, come tweeting in, and then we will tell it without fact-checking. How do you know you're not lying about somebody if you weren't there, you didn't see it, you weren't privy to it? Just shut it, okay? God hates the false witness that speaketh lies. Look how he deals with them. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and in verse 15. This is the law, but God still, by principle, though he can't engage the world in this way, he doesn't engage the world in this way, and lets us kind of have our own free will of things. This is how God would, in his perfect world, run things. Verse 15, our witness shall not rise up. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. So if somebody's coming at you, and it's a single person with lies against you, put it down. God doesn't take these things seriously, and men should neither. Problem is that men haven't read Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. They don't understand that everything needs to be based on the mouth of two or three witnesses. Not the mouth of two or three col collaborating witnesses. You know, three guys get together and they're going to start telling lies about such and such, whispering and trying to get that published in public. No, but if I have a guy over here on this side of the street, a guy on that side of the street, a guy in that car, and there's an accident that happens, and these three come, they don't know each other, they've never seen each other, they didn't talk to one another, and they give witness of what happened. Even if one guy says the car was red and the other two say it was blue, their witness will still be taken into account because they're slightly different because they didn't collaborate. But if it's just one guy, you can't, you can't immediately trust that one, especially if that one guy is related to the scenario. So God gives this principle that two witnesses, yea, three, ought to come to condemn a man for a sin. And then it can be believed. Then it can be at least taken seriously before the judge. One witness can never do so. Verse 16 says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the man between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, and shall be in those, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. Okay, that's something that we're missing these days, where the judge makes diligent inquisition. Now it's lawyers that just present to the judge what he ought to think, right? The judge here makes diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eyes shall not pity. 
But life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. The law here is saying that if I go and make a statement about somebody that, hey, he stole a hundred dollars, okay? And the law is that if he stole a hundred dollars, threefold should be returned to the one that it was stolen from. If I was found to be a liar, then my responsibility, since I condemned him for the hundred dollars plus three times, my responsibility is to give that person a hundred dollars plus three times because I have lied about him falsely. The Bible records there shall be no pity in these scenarios. Life for life. Do you know what that means? If I falsely accuse somebody of murder and the penalty for murder is death, they go to death. I go to death. If I falsely accuse somebody of adultery and it comes out, it's proven that that was a false accusation, the penalty is death and I'm put to death. The false accusation comes for whatever the case in the law. If I am found to be lying, then what would have been condemning my brother, what he would have been guilty of and had to pay as a penalty, comes upon me. It makes it so, like it says in verse 20, those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more such evil among you. People that see me lie about somebody and then get put to death because I condemned him for murder are not going to go and lie about somebody as being a murderer unless they're certain. They're going to fear, they're going to hear and say, I don't want to be like that by word. The man that is condemned and I say, hey, he murdered somebody and it's proven to be true in the court of law that was set up here where diligent inquisition was made and now he is proven to be a murderer before everybody where they will see him be put to death and me exonerated because I had been the one that witnessed it and, and proclaimed it they're also going to fear because they're going to see look the law served its purpose justice was found he murdered somebody, a witness saw, the witness brought it before the judge, the judge made diligent inquisition, and now that guy's dead because he was a murderer. And in both scenarios, the proper godly routes is taken, people hear, they fear, and you have a better uh, world because of it. False witnesses should fear bringing their lies before people, but we live in a world where social media rules, and I can just say whatever I want about every, anybody. You know when you go to the grocery store, you find all these magazines beside the grocery store, you often have to avert your eyes because they're just disgusting and full of lies. Those whole magazines make a life out of lying about people that they don't even know. They just simply tell stories and tell false accusations and, and speak half-truths and partial truths and exaggerated truths and lie about people and they should all be <laughs> in, in a lot of trouble. They should all be condemned by the Lord for doing so. They should know that when you lie about somebody, you will have life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, and whatever you had condemned them for. And so we need to take solace in this. We need to take encouragement in the fact that God wrote a law. It was perfect. It is perfect. And had we lived it today, it would, things would be a lot different. People wouldn't be so emboldened to stand up and lie about you. People wouldn't be so emboldened to commit crimes. Things would be done in their proper order and everyone would hear and fear and walk a little bit more carefully in the fear of God. And yet here we are. So how do Christians deal with this? God didn't change how he deals with it, okay? The world has changed and deviated from the plan, but God still believes the same way as he believed when he wrote these words. God still wants laws to be enforced the same way they do. So you know what I think is going to happen? I think God's going to set things right. If someone lies about you, someone false false wit bears a false witness against you if somebody says something that you did and you did not do it just just mark it down God's observing and as the perfect judge it doesn't take him long to make diligent inquisition the Bible records that God sees the hearts <laughs> he knows their conscience he knows their intents he knows their motives he knows their plans for lying about you and what they would have for you and so God's going to see this happening. He's going to allow people to lie about you, even build a big lobby against you, and you'll be put before councils. You, you hold your peace. They condemn you. They're like, why won't you defend yourself? And all this goes on as it did in Christ's life. And God knows the hearts of all of those people, and he also knows you. He's refining you. He's purifying you. He's going to help you through it. In the end, things will be settled exactly the way he had planned. 
You'll get a bunch of rewards, even if they put you to death, rejoice and be exceeding glad. You'll get a bunch of encouragement to come out finer for it, a stronger Christian on the other end that can't be swayed even though the multitudes would rise up against them. Rejoice in that and be glad. Great is your reward in heaven. And this is the thing we need to understand. When you are being lied about, hey, rejoice. You're in good company. This is what God has for you. Christians, first and foremost, don't lie about people. Don't slander. Don't falsely accuse anyone. God will hold you to a higher standard and you will not get away with it. Second of all, Christians, when it's happening to you, just walk as Jesus did. Follow the, follow the examples that he gave. Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 5, Philippians chapter 4. You can just follow those. And you can just see that Christ walked the walk that you're walking now. He did it before you as an example. Just follow in his example. Follow in his footsteps. And you're in good footsteps and good hands when you do. False witnesses, false accusers. They're going to increase and increase and increase. Rejoice. You're being fined. You're being refined. You're being prepared for the time when it's someone of your own household that does that for you. You're not going to be able to get through that if you haven't gone through a couple trials along the way. You're not going to be able to face an antichrist if you haven't gone through a couple of trials along the way. You're not going to be able to face mass beheadings and exterminations and them trying to destroy everybody that would even name the name of Christ if you haven't been through a few trials. You're not going to be able to stand before somebody that's about to put you down and put you in your place and fire you because of your beliefs unless you've been through a few trials along the way. God's just preparing you. The Apostle Paul learned something. And he's still being instructed. Let's learn something from these trials and continue to be instructed. We haven't arrived yet. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this day and for your word spoken in due time. I pray, God, that you would continue to work these truths in our, in our heart and minds, knowing that the last days are upon us. There's a lot of refining that we need to, uh, we need to go under, and, and, there, and time is short. So uh, we, we expect and we don't, we don't plan that we would get away from these things or expect that our life would just be peachy and easy. And, and uh, you know, that, that's not the life that you walked before us. We shall suffer persecution. We shall suffer tribulation. You promised it so, but you also promised that you would be with us through it. And those, in my experience, are the times when I'm closest with you, when I'm, when I'm facing something on this earth that I, I don't like and I don't enjoy. That's a time when I just feel closest with my Savior. And I love those times, even though it's, it's hard when I'm in them. Help us, Lord, to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, 410 in your hymn book. No will be dismissed. Stand if you'd like, 410. On the first. Encamped along the hills of white, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle where the night shall veil with glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory. Above with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a world with breath swept on or every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Salvation's helmet on each end with truth all girded about. The earth shall tremble beneath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes.
surprise the world. To him that overcomes the foe, why reign and shall begin. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. 